Hello and welcome again to the CSEA Public Sector Local and Unit Election Committee training video series. This presentation is the third in a series of videos created to assist you with preparing for and running the election of officers for your bargaining unit. Before listening to this presentation, you should have listened to the Election Committee training introductory video, as well as the video about nominations and petitioning. This is Leslie Perrin, Deputy Counsel in the CSEA Legal Department and a Staff Advisor to the Statewide Election Committee. Today we will be discussing what happens once the petitioning or application period in your local or unit has ended. This segment of the training is relevant for locals and units where you have at least one race for office. In other words, not all of your positions to be elected were filled without opposition at the close of your nomination period. You have at least one office for which there is more than one candidate. So in this segment, we will cover what needs to happen when you have to have balloting or voting before your process will be complete and you can report your results. We will cover how to conduct a drawing for position on the ballot, how to draft ballots and instructions, the use of ballots in each type of election method, proper campaigning, meet the candidates events, and the role of the election committee in those parts of the process. The next step where you have a race will be to conduct drawing for position on the ballot. As a side note, the third and final election-related list of members will be mailed to you on April 26, 2017. That list is your list of members who are eligible to vote in the election, your VEL or voter eligibility list. Remember that each list is different. You have received a list of members eligible to run for office, which was your candidate eligibility list, as well as a list of members eligible to sign petitions, your MESP list, and in that it is based on a different membership cutoff date and used for a different step in the election process. We'll discuss how to use the voter eligibility list later. When you notified folks that they were successful or unsuccessful in becoming candidates, you should have notified them of the time and place you would be conducting drawing for position on the ballot and explained that they are entitled to be present to participate or observe the process and may send a proxy if they're unable to attend themselves. Ballot position is the order in which the candidates' names will appear on the ballot. When slates are involved in your process, the entire slate will appear on the same line on the ballot. Some candidates feel very strongly that there's an advantage to being first or last on the ballot. The process of drawing for position is all about making the determination of who appears in what order as fair as possible. Candidates or designated proxies, who must also be members in good standing and should provide written permission from the candidate, may attend to observe or participate in the drawing. You should make and keep a log of observers, as noted above in N14. In this slide, you are looking at samples, which are in your booklets of forms as N15 and N16, that show how to determine the order of drawing for position with slates and independent candidates, which means people who are not on slates, and with only independent candidates. Drawing for position will take place in alphabetical order based on the candidate's last names, starting with the highest office to be elected. Where there are slates, the entire slate is drawn once based on the alphabetical order of the last name of the candidate for president. If there is no candidate for president on a slate, such as if there has been an involuntarily, involuntary withdrawal from a slate, you will use the last name of the slate candidate running for the next highest office as the basis for alphabetizing the draw order. If you have only individual candidates, no slates at all, you will place numbered pieces of paper in a hat or a box or an envelope or other similar device. The statewide election committee uses balls in a bingo machine kind of that gets rolled around and then they reach in and pull out numbers. The number of pieces of paper that go in your box or hat or device should match the number of candidates for each office. For example, where there are two candidates for president, you'll use two pieces of paper, but if there are three candidates for vice president, you'll use three pieces of paper to draw for the vice president position. You work your way down from president through the positions until you are finished, as in form N16. If you have only slates, you will place numbered pieces of paper in the container equal to the number of slates. 
In other words, if you have two slates, two pieces of paper. If you have four slates, four pieces of paper. It gets a little more complicated where you have both slates and individual candidates, as in form N15 on the left-hand side of your screen above. With a combination, you determine the office that has the largest number of candidates, whether that's president or treasurer, and place that many numbered pieces of paper in the container when you draw for each position. In other words, if there are two slates, but there are a total of six people running for the position of secretary, you'll place six pieces of paper in the container when you draw for president for, based on, on the slate's president last name, so that the slate secretary candidate has the same chance of being last on the ballot as every other candidate for secretary. The reason for this is that there should really be only two advantages to running on a slate. The first is that during the nomination period, if you have petitioning, the entire slate needs to only collect one set of signatures, and the other is only that you get a slate box on the ballot so that all of the candidates on the slate can receive a vote by one motion from the members. There should not also be an additional advantage for position on the ballot for slates over individual candidates. Once you've determined the number of pieces of paper you need and the order in which the drawing will take place, you'll instruct each candidate or the representative of the slate or the proxy who is present to draw one of the numbered pieces of paper from the container in the proper order. If a candidate or slate is not represented, an election committee member will draw on their behalf when it is the turn of that candidate or slate. Each time someone withdraws a piece of paper that has a number on it, you will announce the number that was drawn. Remember that the number drawn by the slate representative is the position for every member of the slate. After drawing is complete, you will send notice to each candidate of the result of the drawing and post notice to the membership on bulletin boards, as in Form N-17. Once you know the placement of the candidates on the ballot, you will need to prepare ballots, instructions, envelopes, notices, and logs based on the type of election you plan to hold. Each method of election will require slightly different ballot types, instructions, envelopes, and logs. For example, in a mail ballot election, you will need to draft the official ballot, with or without slates, as in MB1 or MB2, but also replacement ballots for folks who claim not to have received them or made an error in filling out the ballot before returning it. For your two types of on-site elections, ballot box or voting machine, you'll need an official ballot as well as absentee ballots for folks who cannot attend the election for a legitimate reason, and challenge ballots for those who show up at the voting location but don't appear on your voter eligibility list but insist that they should be able to vote. The statewide election committee recommends that you utilize the format shown in the samples and the materials. However, you may draft your own ballot, even using a pen and a piece of paper if that's necessary, as long as the ballot and the instructions will be understood by your members. You must identify the election, in other words, Mango County Local 000 Unit 0000 election. The names of the candidates must appear properly spelled in the order determined by drawing for position, and you must note any positions where the candidate is deemed elected unopposed. No voting box should appear by the names of those candidates. Where there are slates, you must have a row or a column with the slate name and a separate box in which members can cast a vote for the entire slate with one mark, as well as separate boxes for voting next to the names of each candidate on the slate still to be elected. As far as voting instructions, there are samples for each type of election in your materials. Instructions appear on the back of each type of ballot with the exception of the sample ballot that is posted on the wall at a voting machine on-site election. For that type, the instructions appear on the front of the sample ballot, CVM3. The purpose of the instructions is to explain how members should mark the ballot in order to effectively vote for the candidate of their choosing, as well as to provide clear instructions about how to return the ballot so that it will be counted. The procedure must be explained for voting, collecting, and counting the ballots. Slate voting instructions must be clear. 
Each ballot type may have slightly different instructions. For example, if you're holding an on-site ballot box election, the official ballot that will be used the day of the on-site election will contain different instructions from the absentee version because the absentee version will need to be returned by mail to the election committee by the deadline for the count. In addition to the ballots and instructions themselves, you'll need to create various types of envelopes, which is also dependent upon the type of election you're holding. You'll need logs and request forms for the alternative types of ballots for your election, such as replacement ballots or absentee ballots. And for on-site elections, you'll need a supply of challenge ballots and envelopes. Finally, you will need to draft and post notices to the membership about the election, which must be posted at least five days before the election takes place. See MB6, BB5, and VM4. There are checklists in your materials for each type of election, as well as samples of every document that you may use to plan and keep track. On the next few slides, I'll quickly go over each method, but the procedures and forms in the manuals have detailed information. Also, as you're going about ballot design and instruction drafting, keep in mind that the, that the advisors to the statewide election committee are here ready and willing to help you with any questions that you have and to even to review ballots that have been, that have been drafted. Mail balloting. The checklist for mail balloting appears on page 26 of the procedures manual. If you have decided to have a mail ballot, which is recommended whenever there are multiple work locations, shifts, and days of work, you'll need to make some preparations for mailing, collecting, and counting the ballots. You may request a set of mailing labels from CSEA headquarters to be used on the outer mailing envelope. The election committee must also arrange for a post office box to which the ballots, as well as any undeliverable mail, will be returned. There must be a location at which the count of the ballots can take place, which will re be reasonably accessible to the candidates in both terms of time and location, and at which there's enough room for the count to take place with observers, who are candidates or their proxies, who must be present and able to view all steps of the counting process, which we'll discuss in greater detail the next time. From time to time, folks call and ask whether it's acceptable to have mail ballots returned to the home of an election committee member. While it's not specifically precluded, it's recommended against because you're not there to guard that at all times, and depending on the number of ballots that will be returned, this could become problematic. Also, members, of the, uh, mem members who are running for office are entitled to observe every stage of the process, which includes going to the post office to retrieve and transport ballots. These forms, MB1 and MB2, show a draft ballot for a mailing method of election where there are no slates running for office. These are samples for mail balloting with slates. As you can see, in addition to the names of the candidates on the slates, there's an extra box with the slate name off to the left. A mark in that box is the same as a vote for each member of the slate. However, there must also be voting boxes within each name because members are permitted to vote across slates, meaning they can vote for some positions on the first slate, for an independent candidate, and for positions on the second slate as long as they only vote once for each office. For either type of ballot, you will need return envelopes. For mail balloting, the ballots may be dropped in the mail no earlier than May 15th, which is the date outlined in the Constitution as the earliest date for the start of voting. Ballots must be mailed at least 21 days before the date they are due back to be counted in order to give members an opportunity to vote, but ballots may not be returnable or counted later than June 15th, which is the date outlined in the Constitution as the last date for voting. They must be mailed first-class mail marked as election materials with the committee address in the upper left-hand corner. The return envelope must bear prepaid first-class return postage, requiring the member's name, address, CSEA ID number for verification purposes, and be addressed to the election committee. There must be a secret ballot envelope bearing that mark contained in the packet along with the return envelope and, of course, a ballot with clear instructions. Since you'll be having a mail ballot election, there are no absentee ballots. All members will have an opportunity to vote over the course of at least 21 days. 
However, you will likely have members call because they didn't receive a ballot or because they made an error and need a new one or a variety of other reasons. The form in your materials and copied above at MB7 shows an example of replacement ballot request form. The committee must decide its procedures for replacement ballots and should keep a log of requests and mailed replacement ballots. Keep in mind that you may receive calls from members whose names do not appear on your voter eligibility list. You must check voter eligibility before providing a replacement ballot. Sometimes the reason the member didn't receive a ballot in the mail is because they were not entitled to one. When you do issue replacement ballots, they should be marked accordingly, both on the face of the ballot, which will otherwise be identical to the official ballot, and as well as on the return envelope. This is so that when you go about counting, which we'll discuss in the next installment of videos, you can determine whether you receive two ballots returned from the same member and ensure that only one is open and counted if it passes verification. The final document for this stage of the mail ballot process is the notice to the membership. As in the sample above, you must clearly explain the method for the election, the details of when and where the ballots will be counted, the right of candidates or proxies to observe the entire process. For mail balloting, as I indicated before, the right to observe the process includes following the committee members to the post office each time ballots are retrieved, whether that's once the morning of the count, or whether, as sometimes happens in our larger locals or units, this takes place multiple times and ballots are removed to secure storage. So all of this information must be communicated to the candidates. Your notice also lets your members know that they should be expecting to see election material in the mail at home and how to request replacements if they make a mistake, don't receive a ballot, or the dog ate it. The method for obtaining replacement must be reasonable for the membership, designed to give everyone the best opportunity to vote. This is similar to the beginning stage of the process where the committee needed to be easily available to members who wanted to pick up or return petitions or nomination forms. Moving on to on-site elections. On-site elections come in two forms, ballot box and voting machine. Voting machine is not very common, but we'll cover it briefly just in case. The to-do list for a ballot box election is on page 39 of the procedures manual. The to-do list for a voting machine election is on page 53 of the procedures manual. For either, you will need to arrange for polling sites, prepare the ballot boxes or voting machines, draft various types of ballots, envelopes, and instructions, publicize the election, and handle absentee ballot requests. For those of you holding a ballot box or voting machine election, your forms will be similar, but not identical. Keep in mind that even though you're not engaged in a mail ballot, you will need to be prepared to mail out and accept returns of a certain number of absentee ballots. Here you can see a sample ballot without slates and instructions related to on-site ballot box voting without slates. These are samples of a ballot and instructions for on-site voting with slates. As with the mail ballot sample, you can see the extra box off to the left that permits for slate voting. The forms here, BB6 and BB7, are the absentee ballot request form and log. When you're conducting an election at a particular voting location, you'll have taken into consideration factors such as the number of work locations, shifts, and days of work for the membership that will be voting, and you should have taken steps to accommodate those factors. For example, a unit with a single work location in which all of the members work from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday will be able to have different voting times than a local with several buildings spread out across a county in which the members work three different shifts over all seven days of the week. In either case, members cannot be required to report to work while on vacation or a past day in order to participate in voting. So, there's an absentee ballot for on-site elections in order to enfranchise as many members as possible. You can see from the request form that in general, acceptable reasons include being on vacation, out on sick leave, on a regular pass day, or some other legitimate explanation. It will be up to the committee to determine what else might be reasonable. And as with the replacement ballots for mail balloting, you'll keep a log of absentee ballots that are handed out. This is because you may find that a person who requests an absentee ballot then shows up at your polling place, so you need to keep track. We'll discuss how to handle that in the next session. Above shows your absentee ballot sample with instructions indicating how to return the ballot in time for it to be counted. BB4 shows the envelopes you'll use for that purpose. 
Again, as with a mail ballot, the outside of the return envelope should be marked absentee ballot, must be posted to prepaid. The final form is your notice to the membership of the details of the voting locations and times, as well as when and where the ballots will be counted. This must be posted at least five days prior to the election. The forms, again, for an, a voting machine on-site election are similar but slightly different from ballot box forms. The main difference from a ballot box election is the need for a sample ballot, which you see on, on the left-hand side of your screen as VM3, with the instructions on the face of the document that indicate how to operate the voting machine. This notice or sample ballot must be placed on the wall at any, lo at any voting location just like when you vote in a municipal or school board election. On the right side of your screen at VM4 is the notice of the election indicating the time and location of voting and counting. As with a ballot box style on-site election, in a voting machine on-site election, you will need to be ready to provide absentee ballots to members who are unable to vote. Above are the absentee ballot request form and log. The sample absentee ballot and voting instructions are shown above. These are the envelopes that you'll use. Again, they show they contain postage, they indicate that election material is enclosed, that it is an absentee ballot, and the address to which those will be returned. Okay, moving on to campaigning. As the election committee, it is not your responsibility to direct or control the conduct of candidates during the campaigning period. However, you may be asked whether certain things are acceptable, and you may find yourselves faced with protests that you must either answer or decide. In general, the information is available on the notice regarding campaigning that you posted back during the early stages of the election process, as well as in the candidate's handbook. The main bullet points are above. Use of the CSEA logo on any campaign material is strictly prohibited because it implies the endorsement of a candidate by CSEA. Use of union and employer funds is also not allowed in support of any candidate. This means any employer. In other words, if a candidate has a cousin who owns a photocopy shop, they cannot make them free copies by way of donation. That is use of employer funds. However, Keep in mind that the activities of the election committee are considered to be candidate neutral. This means that the local or unit or employer may permit use of its offices, equipment, mailboxes, or communication systems for activities that further or support the election process itself. A current officer is not permitted to use his or her position to obtain greater access to the membership for campaign purposes than any other candidate. Visits by candidate are governed by employer policy and practice. Election events or meet the candidates events are appropriate only if put on by the election committee. If the committee is asked about campaigning or receives a protest and there are any questions about how to respond, please call the statewide election committee. The committee's role is to ensure fair, neutral, timely election. With regard to Meet the Candidates events and other similar events that locals or units arrange, these are encouraged as these opportunities lead to an informed membership. However, the gu guidelines must be observed in order to avoid violating the election procedures as well as law governing public sector union elections. Any formal events are to be sponsored only by the election committee overseeing that election. Every candidate must have an opportunity to attend and participate, and the members must have an opportunity to attend the event. So what this means really is that you should contact the candidates before holding or setting up an event like this if you're thinking about doing it. You should ask them whether or not they'd be willing to participate and what their availability is. The last thing you want to do is set something up when they don't want to attend or at a time that they can't come because that will lead to legitimate protests. The event should be held at a neutral time and location so that the membership can come. Every candidate has to be given the same opportunity and amount of time to speak and members should have to be given an opportunity to attend. If union funds are used, candidate events that don't provide an equal opportunity are strictly prohibited. 
Thank you for continuing your hard work. The next video will be the final installment and will cover day of election issues, counting, wrap up, and protests.